Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Is, is, is there anything that says God in your life, in the workplace, in your home? And I get it. We want to leave these amazing legacies of stuff and, and once again, do it. But you know what kind of legacy I want to leave? I want to leave a legacy of God's presence to my children. I want to leave a legacy of God's power to my kids. I want to leave a legacy of this is how you follow Jesus to my children. That's the kind of legacy. Now, you may say, well, pastor, <laughs> I got no kids. Yeah, but do you want kids? Yeah, I want kids. Okay, we'll start living like you had some. And you'll start planning and preparing your life to start living the way Christ wants you and I to live. Leaving a legacy is leaving or transferring something over while you're still alive into your friends, your family, your coworkers. It's not just, I can't wait to die and leave something special behind. And we know that the world's legacy is different. You know, when you, when you see family and someone dies, it can sometimes get cray-cray. I know, I saw it in my own family. When my grandma, my, my grandpa and grandma, they were awesome. They, they did it right, and they had huge land and property and everything. And she, when she passed away, um, she left everything. And we're talking about like $500,000, American dollars of, of property. It was huge. And my mom has 14 brothers and sisters. And I was so irritated when I saw my, my mom go through the pain of seeing all the siblings fighting over what they wanted to keep from their parents' legacy. And I'm thinking, how sad is that? And that's what you see today in our society, in our culture, is we want stuff. When God's saying, I want you to leave my presence in people's life. I want you to leave my love. I want you to leave my hope. I want you to pour in. I want you to transfer everything that I have given to you inside the lives of people. That's what we want to do. Uh, Lori Moore, who invited Chanel in February last year, it's awesome because she came in here and just thought, man, oh, this is weird. Yeah, lift your hands up. Okay, that's foreign, right? But, but, but it took someone who is living a legacy of courage and faith and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and saying to a person like her, you know what? I know what you need. You need, you need God in your life. You need to trust God. And then she came here, and she's been here now. This February will be a year. God has healed her. God has, has made her whole. And, and a few weeks ago, I was talking about how God wants to see more Christians in medicine, more Christians in government, more Christians in the entertainment industry. And I just started just going. She said that day, which was a few weeks ago, she said that day, I knew that it was time for me to go back into medicine. That day. And so tomorrow, Monday, She's going back in for her last interview. So be praying for her that she's going to get this job. She says, because I want to bring God into that place. Leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. Think about it. The disciples, they left us a legacy. You know what the legacy they left us? It's called the word of God. And they literally gave their life for this. They died in order for you and I to get this Bible. In order for you and I to be able to open it every single day. Not for us to shelve it and place it somewhere only in case of an emergency. They left the word of God for us to open it, for us to see the model, for us to see the example, for us to get the answers that we need for our life. They left us this word to govern our life, to govern our decisions. But at some point, we have to realize that every single person leaves something regardless. I'm praying that in 2019 that you and I, that we're going to live 2019 living legacy not just leaving one behind later are you guys in agreement with that not being preoccupied with drama and and problems and and i get it there's going to be problems god never promised that there wouldn't be any problems god never prom promised that there wouldn't be any worry right? he didn't promise that there wouldn't be any fears he just said fear not 800 plus times in the bible so it's not like it's not going to happen it's going to happen but i'm going to stay focused i'm not going to be preoccupied I need to trust God in 2019. I need to know that I know that I know that I know that God can get me out of any situation. And though it may not be easy, but it's possible. So everything I live now in this little 
peace of my life determines where I'm going to be for eternity. Just this. This this is all that matters right now. And for some of you, you're already in the half mark. Some, Some of you, you're probably already at the end mark. But how many know that it's never too late to change? It's never too late to leave a legacy. You may be here and say, well, my kids are already older. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter how old your children are. You can still leave something that's spiritual, not just material. Let's leave a spiritual legacy in our family. Let's leave a spiritual legacy in our kids. Let's leave a spiritual legacy for the people that have the privilege and honor of knowing you. I, 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 um, I was thinking about the disciples. I, I could only imagine when, when they were following Jesus um, and asking the question, hey, Jesus, we've been following you all this time and seeing all these great miracles so why are we here? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Like, why, why in the heck am I here on this earth? I remember when I first got saved, man, I got radically saved. I literally had like a, a Saul to Paul experience. And, and like the first year, I'm like, God, what are you going to do with my, why am I here? You know, because I, ha- I don't come from a great background. It's, it's dysfunctional. It's broken. It's divorce and divorce and, and, and abuse and abuse. And I'm like, God, I have no nothing. Like, what, what am, why am I here? And maybe you've been asking that question, why am I here? Regardless of how old you are, you can be a, a teen, a millennial, or, you know, someone that's already, uh, you know, 50 and better. I don't know. But God has something special for everyone here. And so Jesus answers the question. Obviously, they're asking. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16 says this. He says, let me tell you why you are here. How about that? You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. I love that. I love Mexican food. <laughs> I love, how many like blend food? <laughs> you know, my brother, he lives in Texas, and he's very Texan. He's like, he talks with y'all. Hey, y'all. Uh, it's funny seeing a Mexican talk like that. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> but he's like, hey, y'all, what y'all want to do? I'm like, uh, Mexican. He's like, all right. And so he takes me to Tex-Mex. I'm like, no, it has no flavor, bro. I need flavor. God is saying that you and I are are the salt of the earth, and you and I are to bring flavor to a world that needs flavor. But look at what he says. If you lose your saltiness, you or, or, or how will people taste what? Godliness. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness. Listen, it's amazing how you can start off right with God. You can start off, man, uh, on fire, seasoned, and, and flavorful, but it's so easy along the way, along this journey of life, to little by little begin to lose your flavor. And, and when you lose your flavor, you lose your godliness. For example, um, have you ever been with people that know you're a Christian? They know you're a believer. And let's say you're out hanging out, uh, let's say you're golfing and, you know, boom, you hit and everything's well. They hit, psh, balls everywhere, and they start blankety, blank, 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 and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they say sorry because they think you're God or something, right? Because they're like, oh, you know, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. And, and they do things like that, right? Or you're out with your girlfriends and, and, and they're like, ooh, check him out. And, and oh, I'm so sorry, Tiffany, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't be doing that, right? And so there's this sense of, 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 of like people want to be godly around you because of your salt. But notice this. But he says, but if you lose your saltiness, you are not useful. And God is saying it's time for the church to bring the salt back. Because when you bring the salt back, not only do you bring flavor back into people's life that have been blend, but when you're salty, you also bring favor of God on your life. And that's what we want to see. And then he gives another example. He says, um, if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end in the garbage. Next verse. Here's another way to put it. I love this one. You're here to be light. Everybody say, I'm here to be light. So I'm here to be salt. I'm here to be light. That's what you're here to do. He says this. He says, um, you're here to be light 
bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. He's not a secret. Any secret service Christians up in this place today? He's not a secret service God. No, he's like, man, I want you to be salt, and I want you to be like, for example, if you were to go into your house today, and you go into the darkest room, like my hallway, it's crazy. When I come out of my room at, I, I wake up at 3 a.m. on Sundays, and so it's pitch black. You know, so I walk out, and, and it's like, boom, and I'm just like, but thank God that I'm well acquainted with the hallway that I could at least know, okay, I know I think there's a left right here. I'm like, okay, and then I hit the light switch. When you step into a place that is dark and 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 you may be stumbling around whatever but because you're acquainted because there has been a history of you being in that room you know even though it's dark you know where that light switch is you at least have an idea of where you're going to the moment you hit that light switch darkness can comprehend it in other words when you hit that light boom every single part in that room is going to be lit it's not like darkness is going to be like, oh, okay, oh, hey, is it possible if you can just keep half the room light and leave the other half dark? Like, light doesn't, doesn't negotiate with darkness. The moment you turn on light, bam, all darkness has to flee. It's not an option. It has to go. It's not going to stay. Well, think about it. God is saying, the moment you decide to turn the light back on because you've been acquainted with me, you've known me, you've had moments with me, you've had experiences with me, you've seen me touch you at some point in your life, and if you lost your flavor, if you lost your light, at least you know where it's at, and it's found in Jesus. And then you hit that light switch, and let me tell you something, darkness must go. It can't stay. Every single part of that room will be lit, and now you can see. That's what he's saying here in the Word. Light always wins. Say that with me. Light always wins. God said, let there be light. Light still to this moment right now. It's still expanding. Why? Because God made it clear my light will never stop. It won't, it won't apologize. It, it won't negotiate with darkness. When God set forth light, he says, let there be light. Light keeps going, and light keeps going in every single person, every single soul that comes to Jesus Christ because of that light. That's so awesome. How do I do that now, Pastor? Glad you asked. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28. Look at this. I've read this verse a million times, but I have a different revelation of it. It says, do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. You know, we can call this legacy or we can call this landmarks. He says, don't remove the landmarks which your fathers have left. What does that mean? Let me just give you my interpretation, and I really believe it's, it's solid interpretation. You and I many times in this journey of life, we have experienced things, whether they have been good or bad, whether they have been great or painful, whether they have been victorious or whether you've had losses, it's kind of like your, your phone. I don't know about Androids, but iPhones, we can deliver you today from that. <laughs> but iPhones have this wonderful technology where I have about 4,000 pictures on my, on my phone right now. And I can't even remember where the heck I've taken all those pictures. But I kind of stumbled into this part of the phone that literally gives you a map of landmarks of every single place I took the picture. So let's say I was in Hawaii. Click. It literally has a little landmark or a little red. It's like a little red bubble. And it shows that that picture was taken in Hawaii. And it's amazing. I'm just like blown away like, whoosh, like wow. That's amazing. And so think about this. Every single place that you have been, every single season that you have lived, there is a landmark that God is saying to you and I, I don't care how bad, I don't care how ugly it is. I mean, he cares for you, but he doesn't care how bad the enemy had tried to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. God is saying, I want you to not remove the landmark that your ancient fathers have left. Or, or for example, don't try to remove anything that you've experienced, no matter how 
painful, how hurtful it's been. God's saying, I will turn what the devil meant bad for you or what he meant for harm, and I'll use it for something good. And it made me think about this because um, I started thinking about landmarks of my life. Like, okay, Mauricio, what are some moments in your life that were pretty, like, like life-altering, life-changing? And, and I remember when I was 19 years old, um, we gave birth to Alexis. I don't recommend it. Okay, 19 is way too young. But I was 19 years old. And I remember being in the hospital, and it was beautiful because when my daughter was born, I got to hold her in my arms. I mean, 19 years old, a kid having a kid. And I'm just like, wow. Well, I can remember, I, as I'm telling you this, I can picture the room. I, I can I, I, I have the smell. And, and I even remember when the doctor said, here, cut the umbilical cord. I'm like, oh, heck no. <laughs> you cut that thing. That's nasty. You know, and that's, that's just a 19-year-old, you know. And, and so it was beautiful. It was life-changing. And I can literally, as I'm talking to you right now, I can visualize it in my head. I can see the room. I know exactly where it's at. If I were to go back to that hospital, I can, ex- I can literally walk us into the room where she was delivered. It's that vivid. It was a landmark. But in that same moment of something beautiful came something tragic. Hours go by. They take my baby to get her cleaned up, and, and, and they're not bringing her back. And I'm getting ticked, and I'm a 19-year-old that is pretty crazy out there. I'm wild. I don't have Christ. And, and I'm wild, and I'm angry, and I'm, uh, I'm a hothead, and, and, and just a very bad temper. And, and I'm ready to, I literally walked into the hospital, and I was, I was going to beat up the doctors. They called the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department, which was down, it was a county hospital on top of that. You know, praise Jesus for that. <laughs> they come up. And, and they're about to arrest me because I'm, I'm about to knock out this doctor. And, and listen, any father, listen, you don't touch their children. You don't mess with a parent's child. You just don't do that. That's holy ground. I'm saved, but I'll get unsaved and get resaved later. I don't know. <laughs> you know, praise Jesus. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. That's my baby. And the instinct of the father kicked in. And so the sheriff was very nice, and he said, hey, listen, calm down, man. If not, we're going to have to arrest you. And he says, what's your problem? I said, you know what? They took my child, and they have not brought her back. It's been three, four hours now. They don't say anything to me. This is unacceptable. And I was just, you know, going off, cussing up a storm. And he said, okay, let me go find out what's happening. So he went there, and the cop said, he's got to see his kid. That's his right, and he was nice and everything. So I find out that my daughter had a blood disease, and they gave us 48 hours for her to live. It was It was horrible. But I can tell you, as I'm telling you this story, I remember the landmark where I'm sitting on this bench in a hallway, the place where I was losing it. And after hearing all this, I was thinking to myself, how am I going to explain this to my wife that our daughter is dying? How am I going to explain to my wife that our daughter has a blood disease? How am I going to, how am I, I'm just like, mine is just going. And I thought to myself on that bench, and I can still remember the floor and everything, the pay phone, everything, everywhere. And I'm sitting there, and I thought, man, if I only had a gun, I would shoot myself right now. I can't take it anymore. But isn't it amazing that God will never waste any landmark? Because in that moment, I remember that one guy that always shared Jesus with me about how God loves you and how he heals you and how he wants to redeem you. And, I, and I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. And, but, but, but think about this. God does not waste any seed that gets sown in any heart. And when I was at my lowest point, man, I made the phone call, of course. You know, the guy came. He laid hands on my daughter. It was, it was history from there. My daughter was turned around healed. It was amazing. But it's a, it was a landmark. And I don't know what landmarks of pain you've been through, but God's not going to waste it. I don't care what kind of landmarks of awesome greatness and victories and, and, and prosperity and all. God got to use it all. God is not wasteful with your mistakes. God is not wasteful with your sin. God will anoint your mistakes and do something better with it. But you have to come to the place where you make a decision. Everybody say decision. You can't have a new year without an old you. With an old you. You have to have a new you, a new mind, in order for you to experience a new year. But that takes a decision. I I, I could remember, too, uh, you know, the building where I gave my life to Christ to this day, it, that's, that's a landmark. And, and I remember because I remember when I walked in the first time and I gave my life to Christ and, and it was amazing. And, and it's a building right on, on Vine Street and, and, and Ventura. And, uh, and it, was, it was just amazing, Vineland and Ventura. And 
I, I just, it, it's where my life was changed. It's where I developed my faith. It's where I grew up spiritually. It's where I started serving God. It's where God delivered me from all the junk in the trunk. It's where God set me free. It was amazing. And so today, it's just a CVS store. It's a, and so there's been times where I'll take my kids still to this day. I'm like, see that parking lot right there? They're like, Dad, we already know. I'm like, yeah, right there. That's where it all started. <laughs> I would serve every Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I would help people walk into the church, help them find parking and greet them and love them. And I would tell my kids that was the place that God and I talked every single Wednesday and Friday. While everybody was enjoying service, I had to stay out because in those days, in that neighborhood, man, they'd jack your car in the middle of church. Our security guard got jumped in our parking lot with his own baton. <laughs> I never got jumped. <laughs> that was wild when I came. I'm like, what's wrong with you, man? He's all face over. I'm like, what? I got beat up with what? My baton. Where's your baton? He took it. I was like, Help you, Lord. You need Jesus, bro. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> you got flavor, but I got favor. <laughs> but, but it's those moments where you're just like, wow, God. Like God doesn't, he doesn't despise your landmarks. He doesn't remove those moments of your life. He, 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 he creates memories. I, I think about when I got invited to Israel. If you've never been to Israel, go to Israel. It's amazing. And, and I was invited, and my friend, you know, said, hey, can you go to Israel? I'm thinking, oh, I can't leave the church. He's like, I'll pay for you. Oh, I can leave, you know. <laughs> Tell me when, man. Don't worry about it. They'll be good. And so all paid trip to Israel, and so I went. It was just like maybe seven of us pastors. And, uh, and, as, and, and of course, we know that. Why do people, why does everybody like to travel to Israel? Because they want to go see landmarks. And while I was walking through Israel, I was very taken back through those moments of where, where men and women who, who left us a legacy, like you think about, you know, the Apostle Paul when he was walking through the Damascus, the road to Damascus, think about it, that was the place where God literally demasked him of all his false identity and gave him a new identity in Christ Jesus. When you think about Peter and when he preached his first sermon and, 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 and thousands came to know Christ after he had denied him, you're just like, wow, you think about different people People in the Bible and you just get this awe because they're landmarks, they're their 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 memories, their 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 history of, of of men and women who were willing to sacrifice and give their life for something great. But the one that just blew me away, the one that constantly impacts me is the one of the like I shared in communion, the feeding of the five thousand. Think about this. So I'm there at the actual location where Jesus preached his sermon to 14 plus thousand people. And number one, you're thinking like, wow. Like I'm looking at this mouth. Everybody, all the other pastors were like, come like, okay, bam, and they leave. I was just like, just like, whoa. Hey, we gotta go, no. Like how is that? And the acoustics and how, how everything, like Jesus thought about everything when he preached. Every single word, you can speak very low and be like, hey, and it literally, your voice travels. I mean, just, ah, well, God's amazing. And, and, and this is the place where, where uh, we know the story where he, he wants to feed the people, but, but uh, the disciples were like, well, we can't do it. But here's, here's the miracle was not in the feeding of the 5,000. Stay with me. The miracle was not in the feeding of the 5,000. The miracle was in, inside a young little boy's lunch bag. Because without the lunch bag, without that little boy being willing, without that little boy being generous, without that little boy being someone that wanted to get closer to Jesus and said, here's my lunch bag. I got five loaves and two fish. I got my McFish sandwich. Here you go, Jesus. And he gives them this fish. And think about this. God takes what a child is willing to give up. God takes something that a child is willing to be generous with. And let me tell you something. I don't know about you, but I'm praying that in 2019 that you and I would be that sack of lunch that puts our lunch bag in the hands of Jesus and watch what he'll do with your life. So the miracle is not what Jesus did. That's the given. That's the duh. We know what Jesus does. He opens blind eyes. He makes the lame walk. He makes the deaf hear. He, he feeds the multitudes. The miracle is in the person who's willing to give everything of themselves to him. Because without you, there is no miracle. 
without your cooperation, there is no transformation. He needs you. He needs you. Do you think that little boy was thinking leaving a legacy? (laughs) Man, he's just thinking opportunity. This looks like a job for God. A little boy trusted God with his lunch bag. He knew that God can do more with his little than anyone can do with their much. And God took that sandwich and he, and he took that fish and, and that bread and he blessed it. And let me tell you something. Not only did he bless it, then Jesus multiplied it. Here's my question to you. I wonder, I wonder what the people who got the leftovers experienced after that. Notice when God blesses something, he leaves leftovers. That means that when you are done walking out your call, when you are done walking out your divine purpose, God will leave a leftover of you for your children and your children's children. 2019, I want to have leftovers of God's presence in my children's life. I want to transfer God's presence. I want to transfer God's trust. I want to transfer God's walk from my life into their life. I want to transfer, you know what, everything that God has given me to my children, not just materials, but my spiritual gifts. I want to give everything to them. I want to pour out into their lives. That's what we want. Here's what the little boy would probably say if he was standing here today. Let me show you real quick. The boy left us two thoughts about legacy. Number one, he would probably say, God is a God of multiplication and leftovers. Man, the kid, how many know that leftovers always taste better the next day? <laughs> On New Year's Eve, I cooked a good carne asada. I didn't like it. Not carne asada. It was a steak, a, a, a rib. I didn't like it. I was like, oh, that's okay. Everybody's like, oh, my God, so good. The next day, I'm like, oh, my God, it was amazing. I'm like, wow. I'm like, tearing up like that. It's the same steak you ate. I'm like, nope. It tastes, it tastes so much better the next day. You guys got to taste this. It was, I was like, here, try a piece. You know, it was like weird. But it's leftovers. So just, to make, just to imagine what you're living now is awesome. But what you leave behind will be awesome myrrh. It's good. Okay, it'll be gooder. It's great. Okay, it'll be greater. Number two, he would say, whatever you give to God, He multiplies it, and he leaves something for others to enjoy. So it's not just about living for you. It's about living a life for God. It's about giving your whole lunch back to him and let him multiply. Here's what the boy would probably say. He would probably say, hey, listen, if you give God your energy, he'll multiply your energy. If you give God your time, he'll multiply your time. If you give God your health, and that doesn't mean like, okay, Lord, I give you my health. No, that means good, get moving, exercise. God will give you more life. If you give God your finances, he'll multiply your finances. Anything that you give to God, God will multiply it. He will bless you. He will lift it up and say, Father, bless them in Jesus' name. Amen? Are you guys getting this? Everybody say Landmark. Yeah, we all have landmarks that we have to leave. And maybe you're like, man, you don't know my past. Get over your past. But you don't know, do I deny? I didn't say deny your past. I said you have to get past it. You can't move forward if you're looking back. You can't. You, 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 you can't. And, and I've had people approach me and say, well, how do I do that? It's a decision. It's a decision. You have to make a personal decision. You you know why it's hard? Because you have to make it yourself. That's why it's hard. Because you have to make the decision of forgiving. Don't be the person that passes on a legacy of unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment. Because how many know that those are generational curses? Man, break the curse while you're alive and say, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And I'm going to leave joy and peace and strength and victory and power. I'm going to leave something different behind. I'm not going to leave what everybody else left me. Because my family left me a bunch of curses. But when I came to, it was, I wish, my kids, I'm like, you're blessed. Okay, because I've had to curse this and curse that and break that and rebuke that. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's like matrix, you know, like. But, but I've broken the curse. And now I say, okay, now I leave you a new legacy. You'll be a different kind of family. You'll be a different kind of people. You're going to be better. You're going to do more. You're going to be more. You're going to have more. Why? Because it takes one person to make a decision. I'm not going to keep being unforgiving. I'm going to stop being bitter. And you're going to get mad at yourself. Well, I don't know, but you don't know what to do. 
You can do that all, all your life, and that's what you'll die with. It's possible. Let's close with this. Look at what God did with all these people that were jacked up, people who changed their legacy. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Everybody say, there is hope. Let me see all my ugly people. Just wave your hand. Don't do that. <laughs> Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and a, was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Come on, somebody. <laughs> just, just like, hey, y'all need God. You know, just... Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Andrew lived in the shadow of his big brother. Peter denied Christ. All the disciples fell asleep while praying and ran away when Jesus really needed them. It's amazing how many of us will pray with joy for our food, but when you pray, we fall asleep. Why? The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. Zacchaeus was too small. Timothy had an ulcer. He was always scared. Paul was a Christian killer. And oh, Lazarus was dead. So you can't say that God can't change your legacy. All these different people had to make a personal decision. They had to make a decision to change the way they think, change the way they view. And the only way you can do that is as you renew your mind in Christ Jesus. We need to bring God back in the picture, guys. It's, and I know we preach, I've been preaching on vision and vision boards and goals and all that stuff, and we're all doing it. And that's great. But here's what really impacted me. Um, after so many services, a billion church services, I was exhausted, tired, and I was home. And, um, and I was... Uh, I was TV surfing, and I was just going through channel after channel after channel, and I came to uh, The Ellen Show. I'm not a fan, but I mean, it's, it was cool. It was interesting. And I saw this, this part of the segment where um, there was a woman who was on Top Chef, and, and they were kind of recapping her, her, her uh, the Top Chef show and how she was like the most popular, most liked, and all these things. And, and this woman had a dream of, of, of opening her own restaurant and, and traveling the world and cooking everywhere. And just the, the girl was young, probably in her 30s, and just, just on fire. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. But, you know, it, it goes from this amazing story of, of all of her accomplishments and how far she came. But then the music changed. Ever say the music changed. All of us will have a moment where our music will change. And she's telling her story on this video, and the music changed. And she starts saying, and after I went through the Top Chef competition on TV, I had so many wonderful doors open up for me. She said, but I started feeling pain in my body. And she said it was in like my ovaries. And she kind of put it off. Two months later, goes by. Now it's like pain is spreading different places. And she said, uh, I finally went to the doctor, and they did a CAT scan of my body. And she said, I got a call from the doctor. said, please come in. We need to talk. And she walks in, and she says, you know what, doctor? She's a pretty bold girl. If you watch her testimony, she's bold, man. I just wonder if she has Christ, but she's bold. She told the doctor, just tell me what I need to hear. Just tell me the truth. Don't hold back. Don't waste my time. Just tell me what. I need to hear it real. And the doctor said, unfortunately, you only have one year to live. You have uh, ovarian cancer. And this girl said it was like everything came crashing down. Just everything, everything, her hopes, her dreams, her desires, her passion, her zeal, just everything, everything, just one moment, just like that. And as I was watching it, I was thinking, it's interesting that I'm watching this as I'm preparing for us to do leaving a legacy to our church. And I thought, you know, God, what does all this mean? And, 
And as I started just kind of talking in my head, I started thinking, like, Mauricio, what if 2019 was your last year? Would you live differently? Would you worry less? Would you look at your, your problems as whatever? I mean, it's your last year. Would you think different? Would you believe different? Would you, would you step out and go even further? Would you reach further if you only had one year left? to? And I was asking myself, I'm not trying to curse myself, okay? But I was just asking myself because if you're going to have an awesome 2019 with God, then we have to start living as if it was our last. God wants us to live full of Christ and die empty. Why do you die empty? Because I gave everything that was inside of me to the world. I gave everything that was inside of me to my children, my family. You have to live that way. And I want to challenge you, church. Stop thinking about the next five years, even though, yes, do it, but sometimes we get too far and then we start stressing out. How about just think about how you'll live for God in 2019? Because I believe that those little steps that you start taking in 2019 will pay off in the, in the long run. They'll pay off in the second year, the third year, the fourth. Your life will completely change if you start making a decision. I'm not going to give half my lunch. That boy could have given like one bread and one fish. He could have gave two pieces of bread and half a fish. But he gave all five breads and all two fish. When you decide to give God all of you, God will multiply you. He'll multiply your life. He'll multiply your healing. He'll multiply your joy. He'll multiply your peace. But you got to come to that place where you have to say in 2019, it's all of me. Stand to your feet. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.